Hey guys, Bantad Vaid here with Ableton Tips and today I'm going to be taking you through this melodic house loop that I made. It's kind of like in the style of Ben Burma or Lane 8, something you might hear from them, so it's very major and pleasing and, I don't know, warm and happy. And it sounds like this. <laughs> So let's take it from the top here. You'll see that everything I have is in this group called filter. So if I just open this up, it's got containing everything. And the reason for that is I just halfway through this loop, right before we go into bar 25 here, I just take out the low end from everything. And it's just for me quicker to do that by grouping everything, putting an auto filter on, and then automating the, the low frequency here from zero up to 146. And so you'll hear that. <laughs> It just uh, really helps with the energy transfer from that first half of the drop into the second half. And then the second group I have here is called the sidechain group, and that's because I am sidechaining basically all the melodic elements to the kick. It's only a very light sidechain, so it's not like really pumping. And how I set up my sidechain, uh, if you just open up compressor here, enable sidechain, sidechain from kick, and then I use this EQ to basically filter out the sub from the kick as it comes into this compressor. So we only really sidechain to the click, which is a much shorter sample. And then it sounds like this. You get this nice short sample to work with. You can control the, the release or the, the length of the sidechain using this release. So that tape basically takes care of our sidechain. Let's get into all the musical elements. So the first thing I always start with when this, I'm d doing this kind of a track is, is a drone sound just to create like a harmonic bed to write to. And it's a, a very simple sound. Let's, let's check it out. So first of all, the MIDI is just one note. Uh, we, we're working in B major here. And uh, so the note here is on B. And um, it's really just a saw wave with some unison on it. So if I turn off this unison and the filter, sorry, we really just got a, a saw wave here on oscillator one on wavetable. So this is at 68. And then we're filtering it out down to 1.1 kilohertz. And nothing's being modulated. It's super simple sound. In fact, I could probably just made the sustain at zero to make it a bit smoother. But let's just leave it how it was. And then we have some unison on it. I think, what was it set to? Classic. So unison is in classic mode. And we are on voices, three voices here. And the amount is at 12%. Just to create a little bit of movement in the sound. And then we going into this reverb here. And the reverb is just going to blur the sound. It's on 100% wet. The high end's a bit rolled off here. And it decays at 1.2 seconds. So it's pushing it far back in the mix and it's really just a subtle element in the mix if I had to disable it. You can hear it when I turn it off, like something's missing, but it's not in your face. It doesn't need to be crazy and evolving and moving around. Mainly it's just there for me to start the idea off. The next thing I started doing was working on the melody and this is our melody. And so you can have a look at the notes here. I'm not going to do a whole dive into music theory because to be honest, I didn't use music theory when I wrote this. I just did it by ear. But one thing that is maybe kind of interesting from a music theory perspective is that I always find major keys quite difficult to write in because they can often sound really cheesy. And so what I seem to do by default when I write in them is to spend a lot of time in the relative minor. So how you find relative minors in on your keyboard is you can count down three semitones from your major tonic or the first note. So if we're working in B major, we count one, two, three, we land on G sharp, which would be 
if we work from here, if this was our root note, then we'd be working in G sharp minor using all the same notes that are highlighted here. So if you spend a lot of time writing almost like you're in G sharp minor while kind of using this B as your anchor, you lead to a bit more of a, a minor feeling while still using that major scale, so it's less cheesy. So that's why I started on this G sharp. And we're going up to the D because now we're building basically this G sharp minor chord almost without the, the third in it. But here the, the B is the third. So I guess if you had to kind of picture this as a whole, it creates this minor feeling. And so it's a bit more melancholic, not so cheesy. Major. And the important thing also with this is that we have these notes that kind of lead us back into the repeated melody. There's some slight variations here. You can see the bottom note changes from this E um, down to the E flat. And that's that's happening as the bass line changes. The bass line's only moving between two notes, but we'll get into the bass line after this. And then on the final repetition, we have these two notes instead of doing this. Which just sounds super nice. Um, I love that ending. Okay, so the interesting thing about the MIDI is you'll see that the velocities are all seemingly random. I did randomize them, but I did also spend quite a lot of time playing with them and customizing them so that the melody sounded as emotional as possible. So you'll see in the wavetable, we're modulating here using MPE. If you go to velocity here, you can modulate certain things with the velocity. I think by default, it's set to amp only. So the volume will be getting quieter and louder depending on how hard you're playing the note. But I also mapped it here to the filter frequency. So if I had to just show this with a MIDI keyboard, my MIDI keyboard's not working. But if I show you here, you can hear this. note gets brighter and darker as I play with the MIDI. And so this melody starts to feel a lot more human and emotional because of that mapping. And I think that's quite important. Something that I noticed when I listened to Lane Aid's music is his synths are always like, they're very human, humanized. And I think he does that with velocity. Okay, so let's, uh, let's get into the synth now that that's been covered. So as you see, we're using wavetable and we've got a bunch of effects. I'm just gonna turn that off, uh, turn off the second oscillator and filter, and then we can check out what this, what's actually happening here. Under basic shapes, we're using the saw wave. So if you set this to 67%, you get the saw wave and it sounds like this. Oh, sorry, let me turn off this unison. What was it set to before I forget, noise. And you can hear there's a, other than it just being a plain saw wave, you can hear this like vibrato in the sound. And that's done using an LFO. So here I've got LFO 1, set the rate to 8.79 hertz and the amount to 2.3%. It's a very small amount because this thing can get out of control really, really quick. And so the amount here that this LFO is doing here is 2.2. Is all right, and then we go into this filter. And the filter is being modulated by envelope two. And this is the shape of envelope two. One, uh, one millisecond attack and 420 milliseconds decay. Sustains at 45%. We've got a bit of release on it. And then we set to PRD mode here, which is our Moog filter. And the drive, this enables drive. And so I can add a bit of drive to the filter. A little bit of distortion makes it a bit more like I don't know, analog sounding. And um, the oscillator position is also moving ever so slightly. I don't think that was super important to the sound. I was probably just experimenting. Yeah, you can, you can barely hear a change. And then we add the second oscillator which is just a bit of white noise. But this white noise is more of a, um, I don't know, it's like, it's a, it's a wavetable, so it's not generated white noise, so it doesn't sound like white noise. 
sounds more like just a, a wavetable. And it's really quiet, but it is adding a little bit to the sound. And then I really wanted like a bit of a noisy high end. And what I found for that in Wavetable, because Wavetable, you can't actually use proper noise, uh, is this unison mode. So I set that to noise. And that gives it this like a bit of dirt, a bit of dust to the sound. And so that's set to seven voices and the amount is 26%. So you'll notice on the synth these little red dots and that's because I'm automating certain stuff. So here uh, we've got the unison amount being automated and you'll hear it gets a bit dirtier on some notes and a bit noisier. And there's other things that I'm also automating, probably would have noticed these over here. So here's the attack and the decay automation. And that's also important with a sound like this because it's really repeating this, this melody over and over again. You want a lot of movement and evolution in the sound. And so I love automating attack here. You can hear as the attack comes up, uh, you get like some nice notes that don't just sound plucky anymore. They're kind of fading in. And I love that sound. The decay over here moves up too, so the notes get longer. And then shorter again. Okay, so that's pretty much it for the synth part of it. Then we've got some effects, just some delay set to three and four here with some high feedback and the mix brought down a bit. And then also the filter adjusted to so take out some of the highs and lows. And that just puts it into a nice space. And some reverb, quite long, 6.8 seconds, but I've taken out all the mud from it and some high end. And just brought down the mix amount and also filtered the input signal over here. So there's like two stages of filtering. This is basically filtering the incoming signal and this is shaping the, the tail of the reverb. Then I'm filtering out the low end and brightening it up a bit by boosting it here, adding a bit more drive. You can hear that's like distorting the reverb a bit. It's adding a little bit of distortion to the delays too. And I really like to do that sometimes. Um, I know a lot of people say you're supposed to put your distortion before your reverb and delay, but there's no rules. And I just like the sound of distorted delay and reverb. So that's what I do sometimes. Then filtering out the lower end and a bit more mid range because so the saturator would have added some low end back in. And then we have this EQ8. Again, taking out some, some of this mid range, it was feeling a bit muddy in the mix and boosting a little bit more of that presence over there. So that's it for the melody. Just a quick break before we go back to the tutorial. If you find these type of videos helpful, we can highly recommend the PML Academy with over 35 full-length online courses, spreading over topics like writing chords and melodies or arranging your songs to producing entire songs from start to finish. So check out the link in the description to see what's inside the All Courses bundle exactly. Okay, and then we have the bass line. And the bass line is, you'll see it's not actually touching on that B. So the bass line would have you thinking we're probably more in, in G sharp minor because we are moving between this G sharp and this E. This is the, the one and this is the six. And I really love this kind of a bass line. I use it in a lot of my songs. You might notice if, if you have listened to my music, my one song Coming Home uses this bass line progression. It does have like an extra note up there, but I am using this movement. And so moving between these two notes also helps stay away from the cheesiness of being in a major key. And the notes fit and uh, I think it just sounds really nice. <laughs> Especially when we come around and move into this note back again. And that drop down to the six just sounds so nice. Um, so yeah, there's no rule that says if you're writing in B, 
major, you have to use the note B major in your bass line. The sound is analog. And so let me just turn off the filter here and the second oscillator. This is how it sounds when you load it up. So it's just a saw wave. Nothing fancy happening there. The amp is set to sustain 0.96, so it's basically supposed to be at 1, I guess. Maybe I just accidentally didn't go all the way up. And then oscillator 2 is where we get that, that corded feeling. So we up one octave and seven semitones. And that's creating a fifth, like a power chord. And so it makes the bass line feel more like chords than a bass line, which was the goal here. That helps a lot, adds a lot of harmony to the track. And then we're filtering out everything up to 118 hertz. And uh, this filter is, it's not doing too, it's not like cutting it off over here, so you're still getting quite a lot of mid-range because the slope's only a 24 dB slope. And um, we also got this envelope on it, so it's not actually at 118. Uh, you'll see the envelope set to 4, but if I had to set this to 0, then we, we are basically only getting sub. And this, this would have happened simply because the default envelope setting here is 4, but you can see here the sustains at 1. So this envelope's not actually serving much of a purpose. It's just how it was set up by default, and this is how it sounds. So then we have uh, the amp envelope, and I've explained the shape here. So yeah, it's a really simple sound. It's how it sounds out the gate. And then I just added this EQ, so boosting the sub, taking out some of that mid-range and some of the high end. Yeah, so then let's get into this ARP. And the ARP is, sounds like this. And when I made this ARP, I, d I didn't really do it because I wanted to add more harmony to the track, even though this kind of does. Really the purpose of it was more for groove. So here without this, the track feels like it's lacking some like danceability. <laughs> And this is like, because it's landing on 16th, it's almost acting like a shaker would, providing that, like just these transients that, that just help the groove of the track. So don't look too much into this from a music theory perspective, because again, this is just done by ear. But there is some change in the notes here, but all really just done by ear. There's, there's no real music theory happening here. Uh, so those are the notes. And the sound is super simple. Let me just turn off the effects. And the second oscillator, and this. And the unison. Let me turn that up so you can hear it. So that's how it sounds. We're just using a saw wave, then we're adding a second oscillator. That's one octave up, 12 semitones. Then we modulating this filter here, again set to PRD mode, and with a ton of drive, so 21 dB of drive. And um, that's being modulated by envelope 2, I believe. Yes, envelope 2, filter frequency. And this is the shape. So it decays at 127 and sustain at 32%. And then we have some unison. And that's just kind of widening it and detuning it a bit. And then we're going into delay. And the delay is really simple, so it's set to three, ping pong, and the dry wet's at 50%. Uh, so I didn't really touch those. And then we're taking out the low end. I'm just cleaning it up a bit. But this is so super quiet in the mix, I think I had it somewhere around there. Okay, so yeah, that's that's the ARP. And then we have this pad. And so the pad here, I just wanted like almost to use it as like a riser to bring us into the next uh, eight bars. Sounds like this. And we're using this B major chord here, B, D, F with the B on top. 
And let me just take off all these effects. Sounds like this. So we've got a saw wave and some white noise. And you'll see in operator, usually this white noise would be modulating the frequency of this oscillator, but you can change the routing of this. So here, if I set this, if you click over here, you can change the routings over here. So this is how it would have sounded initially. But when we set this into parallel mode, so the oscillators are all just going straight out to the filter and out the master, then they're not affecting each other. So the envelope shapes, they fully sustained envelopes. And the white noise is just adding like some breathiness to the sound. And then I've added some spread to kind of just widen it and detune it a bit. Then I got this band pass spinner, which is just a preset. If you just search band pass spinner here, you'll find it. And that's just a, an auto filter preset. And it makes the sound sound like this. So it gives it some nice resonance and also pans it around left to right. I found the panning wasn't enough, so I wanted some more, I added some auto pan. Then um, we got some reverb here. And that really makes it sound beautiful. So we've got a long reverb here, 15.4 seconds. And I didn't really touch any of the other effects. I just put it up to 79% dry wet. And then this auto filter is doing the job of sweeping it in like this. And then we got this uh, EQ8. Which is taking out all the mid range. But it's, it's quite resonant. You can hear this ringing that disappears when I turn on this EQ. And that just cleans it up in the mix. Okay, then the next thing is this background lead. I've called it BG lead. And so let's just have a look at this. Turn these effects off. Here's the notes we're using. So again, this is uh, we stay sticking to B here and making the track feel a little bit more major here. This the purpose of this is really just to differentiate this section from this section and basically tell a story with melody. And it's almost like a a response to this. So this one goes dun 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 dun, and then bang. It's like a a response kind of thing. <laughs> Oh, I have turned off wavetable. So yeah, basically like a call and response thing. Let's uh, check out the sound. So the sound used here is really just a saw wave with a filter on it. Super simple. Saw wave. Turn on the filter, set it to 215 hertz. Go into the matrix here, and we're modulating it with envelope 2, so set that to 48. And then here, bring down that decay to 1.75 seconds, sustain at 45, and uh, release at 3.2. Then we're just getting this really simple saw wave pluck. But this reverb is what gives it all its character. So the reverb set to 12.9 seconds decay. We're filtering out the low end and the high end, and then setting it to 48%. So it's quite a, a very obvious reverb. But it's pushing it back in the mix, and the reverb has like all the spin in it and chorus and stuff, so it, it really like adds interest to the sound. Okay, let's check out the drums. So all the drums are from Deep Premium Volume 6, uh, which is out now, and this is our kick drum. So this is TE Kick 006, and I really like this kick drum because of the transient. It's like really soft and natural sounding. You don't want this big clicky, punchy EDM kick because it's just not going to fit the track. That's going to sound weird. But you'll hear the low end kind of sounds like a bit distorted. So I just cleaned that mid range up with an EQ and boosted the high end a little bit. And 
that just makes it into a really lovely kick. No other processing on it. Okay, and then we get the Tam loop here, which it sounds a bit more like a shaker to me. And I didn't process that at all. It just sounded really nice in the mix. Just dragged and dropped. It's called Tam Loop 003. And I have this clap. I really like this one um, because it's super loose. So you can see all the hits are different. Another thing that's so great about this is it has this like little bird sound in the background. Uh, that just adds so much to the track. Just makes it so much more pretty. Um, so yeah, it's a super nice clap loop. I layered that with this clap. And I did process this a little bit. So here you can see if we go down to envelopes and we go to track volume, I actually um, reduced the volume of some of these hits just because they didn't really fit the groove of the track and they were maybe just a bit too much for this style of song that we're working on. So if I delete those, you'll hear. It's got like these bongos and stuff. Um, it's not like it doesn't work, but I just felt like it was unnecessary, it wasn't really helping the track much. So I just turned down the volume on those hits. What I really wanted from this clap loop was the, the tight and bright clap that was in it. Because I felt like this clap was lacking the, the snappiness. So if we just mute this one. Yeah, when I turn it on, how it adds like some snap and bite to the clap. And then I just uh, took out a bit of the low end and the high end on that. And then we have this shaker loop. So I like to just use, when I'm doing shakers, I don't like to use just one shaker. I like to have different shakers, different characters. We have that one and we have this one, when there's no processing on it, just work really nicely together. And then you'll see we have this other channel here. This hat loop. And that's just um, adding a little bit more punch to the offbeat hi-hat through this section. adding like a bit more of a click to the hi-hat. Right, so the main hat that you're hearing here is this one. And I wanted the hat to feel like nice and bright and like white noisy, but soft like a shaker. And so I found this hat that actually had the characters that are characteristics that I wanted, but the only problem was the transient was like a hat transient and not like a shaker transient. So I fixed that by or changing the attack here. So you'll see the attack, if I had to bring that down, it makes the, the transient a bit too sharp. Let me just turn off the effects. And it doesn't really fit the vibe of the track. And so if I had to set this back to 11 milliseconds, it softens the attack a bit. And I'm also automating this. So what you'll notice is the decay and the attack are being automated. So here's the decay. And the purpose of lengthening this decay is to make the hat longer through the section. So just pay attention to how the hat sounds as we go into this next section. So it kind of goes from this like really tight, short hat shaker sound to this really long shaker sound and it really adds energy to the track. And so that's the purpose of the decay. And I just felt like I needed to adjust the attack along with the decay to shape the sound correctly. It just sounded better with when the decay was longer, it sounded better to have a longer attack. So that's the reason for that. And then I shaped the sound further by taking out some of the low range. And 
this um, these upper mids and that just makes the hat or the shaker a little bit lighter because really when you're making a song like this you're thinking about light gentle sounds to fit the music you don't want really aggressive energetic drums it's not it's just not going to fit and then this uh, reverb it's mixed in really quietly i turned off the incoming or the input filter and so if you bring this up it, it's really loud so just really really light reverb just to give it a little bit of space and the last thing that's also interesting about this hat is that um, i've got the notes playing at slightly different pitches alternating and so these alternating pitches just add a bit more interest to the hat loop. A bit darker, a bit brighter, it's alternating and we've got a bit of movement and movement is always good. Yeah, so that's it for all the drums and uh, that covers the whole loop. So I'll play it through one more time. Alright, so that's it for this loop. Hope you enjoyed it. If you like the sound of the drums, you can grab these samples on Deep Premium Volume 6, which is out now. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next tutorial.